graduates, distinguished guests, and friends of Utah Technical College. On behalf of the graduating students, the faculty, and staff at the college, it is my pleasure to greet you and welcome you to our graduating exercises. We are honored tonight to have a number of distinguished guests with us, and I would like to introduce them to you at this time. Would you kindly stand as we call your name, and would you please hold your applause until we've had the opportunity to introduce all of them. Dr. Royce T. Flandro, Vice President, Utah Technical College at Provo. Mr. John Maragakis, Vice President of the College Advisory Committee. Mr. Thomas J. Hubbard, Chairman of the College Advisory Committee. Dr. David S. Gailey, Dr. Daly, Gailey is a coordinator of vocational education in the State Department of Education. Dr. Harvey C. Hershey, Administrator, Division of Post-Secondary Programs. Dr. J.J. Campbell, Deputy Superintendent for Vocational Education. Mr. Bertel Bunker, Associate Commissioner, Business Affairs, Utah System of Higher Education. Dr. Burton F. Brazier, member of the State Board for Vocational Education. Mr. Charles E. Peterson, member, State Board for Higher Education. We will introduce our other distinguished guests later in the program. If you care to give them a round of applause, we'd appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have assembled on this most auspicious occasion to pay tribute to 640 individuals who have completed the requirements for graduation at Utah Technical College during this past year. The college conducts four graduation exercises annually. We conduct an exercise at the end of our fourth quarter or the summer program each August. We conduct practical nursing graduation exercises twice annually, once in September and once in March. And then the culmination of our graduation activities occurs at the end of the spring quarter each year, and we are celebrating that momentous occasion tonight. You know, sometimes communications go awry. I had my breakdown in communications the other evening. I returned home late at night, and here was a note on my pillow from my wife, and it said, regardless of what time you come in, call 466-7380. So I picked up the phone and dialed the number, and a sleepy voice at midnight said, yes? And I said, is this 466-7380? And he said, no, it is not. Well, I looked at the note, and I scratched my head. I didn't know exactly what to say, so I said, are you sure this is not 466-7380? And in a rather pleading voice, my friend said, friend, have I ever lied to you before? <laughs> Well, somehow, I felt that I had been pricked by the splendid fractures of communication. But I'm happy to report to you tonight that the graduates before you have not suffered from the splendid fractures of communication. Somewhere along the line, they got the message. And the message I'm referring to is that there are tremendous job opportunities available to young men and women who are trained for employment in the world of work. These graduates tonight 
have been trained in the areas of service occupations, business occupations, skilled and technical areas. And I assure you that there's a job waiting for them that will provide them with satisfaction, a job that will earn them a respectable living and an opportunity that will give them the possibility for greater employment and greater challenges in the years ahead. Now, many of our graduates have already accepted employment. Many more of them will be leaving or departing soon to accept a job in other areas of this great nation. And there are others who are still anticipating employment. But I assure you and them that the opportunity will come. It may be that you have to go looking for it. But the opportunities for employment for individuals in these categories in today's world are tremendous. It is the desire of every young man and every young woman in this great nation to be a success, to have their teachers and their parents and their friends and their loved ones respect them and admire them. And we are all hopeful that we can make a significant contribution to the world. I would say to the graduates, in order to achieve your goal of success and happiness, your job must provide you with answers to the following four questions. Number one, do you enjoy your work? Number two, does the job provide you with sufficient remuneration to live a moderate life? Number three, are you proud of what you're doing? And number four, does your job make a contribution to the welfare and betterment of mankind? Now, I trust that your employment will permit you to answer those questions affirmatively. And if you can't, then I would suggest that you continue your quest for satisfaction and happiness in some other job or some other area. It's been a great pleasure to be affiliated with the students at Utah Technical College this year, and I'm proud to re report to you, ladies and gentlemen, that these graduates represent quality. They're high-caliber men and women. And I believe that they will and that they do have the determination to revitalize this great nation in which we live. I hope that each of you graduates during the years that you've spent at Utah Technical College have had great teachers, for it is written, blessed is he who has a good teacher, for his eyes shall be opened unto the world. During your student days at the college, I trust that we have conveyed to each of you the importance of work. Work is a paramount requisite of success. It was Emerson who said, <clears throat> all the genius I have is merely the result of labor. And that old cliche, give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, is as true today as ever. And it should be included in your code of conduct. <clears throat> I remember the story that a friend of the family used to tell. It was about an old lamplighter in Scotland. And every evening at dusk, the old gentleman would come along with a torch and a ladder. And he would climb up the ladder to the street lamp and light the lamp. And then he would go to the next lamp and light it. Finally, the old man would be clear out of sight, but you could always tell which way he had gone by the light that he had lighted. Now, if you graduates want to be a success, and if you want to find happiness in your work, if you want to be respected and admired, then Take pride in your work.
Do your job with enthusiasm. Be proud of your performance. Cooperate with your fellow employees. Yes, do your job in such a way that when you are out of sight, we'll all know which way you've gone by the lights that you have lighted. On behalf of the college faculty and staff, I wish each and every one of you happiness and success. We encourage you to return to the campus of Utah Technical College often. And we encourage you to transmit the message that job opportunities are awaiting young men and young women who complete programs such as are provided at Utah Technical College and other institutions like it across the land. I wish you all Godspeed. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now continue as printed. Ms. Geraldine Robeson. Senator Moss, President Nelson, faculty, fellow students, what an exciting privilege and honor it is for me to be giving this graduation speech. Of course, if you're like my mother, you're thinking it's a privilege to be sitting in the audience not giving a graduation speech. This is a little like coming home after a long absence to be standing in the stand at Highland High. When I graduated, and I'm not telling how long ago because it's a woman's prerogative not to, I didn't have the time nor the money to continue with my education. I had a part-time job through high school, and it looked like I was set for life. How easy, you say. Yes, it was until the new management decided to hire all new people. Well, I decided to look at the want ads and ask friends about jobs. But I didn't want just any job. I wanted something small, president or vice president. After a fruitless search, I started working as a waitress. And believe me, I'm not putting them down. They worked long and hard for their money. That was when I decided to save my money and come back to school. My hopes were to have a job that had good working hours and paid me well for what I was doing. Although those are still important to me, I have learned many other things. But learning is more su successful when students are encouraged by instructors who teach well and are still friends. That it, the environment of a new and well-equipped school helps maintain a higher degree of enthusiasm and self-respect. I have learned that the world needs each one of us, as the teenagers say, doing our thing. I like to work with my hands, typing and ceramics. Other people like gardening and golfing. Maybe it's just like the cosmet maybe it's just the chance to create, like the cosmetology students who create a beautiful hairdo or the printers who create a well-planned booklet, or the machinists who create new designs in plastic, woods, and metal. We have each had the chance to know and make friends from other departments, learn to see a subject through their eyes instead of just our own. I had a business law class with accountants, business management students, and stenographers. Each group looked on the subject from a different point of view. Some were interested and more informed about the company records, which ones had to be in writing and how long they had to be kept. Others had to know all about contracts, how to get into favorable ones and out of unfavorable ones. Others were just interested in learning about the responsibilities they owed their employers. I had a business of beauty class with executive secretaries and clerk typists. Each group had a wide range of ages and backgrounds and yet we became a unit. We learned to work together, trade ideas, methods, and yes, sometimes assignments, much to the dismay of our instructors. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, or almost said, there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, 
that imitation is suicide, that he must take for himself, for better or for worse. And of all paths a man could strike into, there is at any given moment a right path for every man, a thing which here and now is wisest for him to do. This path, to find this path and walk in it, is the one needful thing for him to do. Each of us is important. After all, what good would it be for a man to create a computer if there wasn't someone trained to use it? Or why have walls and houses if there wasn't a favorite painting or two to cover them? Or why put new cars on the road if there wasn't a mechanic trained to fix them? And believe me, I know how important a good mechanic can be. new horizons in your chosen field, I hope that you will be alert <clears throat> to the thoughts directed to you tonight by a distinguished Utah. The politics of modern day li living is an exciting experience for all, all of us, but few men enjoy the excitement of today's world like a United States Senator. A Senator is likely to wear a dozen hats in the course of a day's events, be it in industry, business, government, or the minute personal concern for the freedom of an individual, a senator has a listening ear. Democratic Senator Frank E. Moss has an insight into the needs of today's progressive world. At his desk in Washington, he is, he is able to keep a finger on the public pulse. His 12 years as Utah representative in the Senate of the United States has given him the status to accomplish many things which he feels are important to the people of the great state of Utah. And as a colonel in the United States Air Force Reserve, he has a feeling for both the need of the U.S. involvement in struggles abroad and the concern for those at home. And so, on this evening, graduates, before you embark on your journey into the world of work, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Democratic Senator from Utah, Frank E. Moss. Senator Moss. Thank you, President Nelson, graduates, members of the faculty, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a thrill and an honor to stand here tonight before this great audience and in front of this gathering of graduates to address them and to address you. Commencements are traditionally and perhaps properly a time for viewing with alarm and for a certain amount of oratorical concern about the eager young graduates who are about to try to get a foothold in the great world outside of their college halls. The commencement speaker then usually gives them a few paragraphs of advice on how much easier it is and how much easier it is to advise than to follow the advisor. And then the speaker usually ends up with a few well-chosen words directed toward the spiritual uplift with a note of confidence in the future. But students, this is not going to be a stereotyped graduation address. It is not the time for stereotype sentiments. You are stepping out into a troubled and divided nation. Our future depends greatly upon the course which your generation charts. I don't need to tell you what is happening. A bitter and ugly spirit has settled upon the land. Students are shot, banks burn, buildings explode. Violent protest has spread from a few campuses to hundreds of colleges in the country. And no community seems safe from discord and disruption. Even this community, sheltered by our towering Wasatch Mountains, even this beloved state, which we have always felt was far removed 
from the conflicts and tensions which racked other areas of our country. But we are not immune. No state or area is. Never has so much of my mail from Utah and from elsewhere as well been filled with such a sense of nervous questioning. Never in my 12 years in Washington have I seen the capital city so divided and so troubled. Never have I seen the United States Senate so worried and so perplexed. In Washington and all over the country, people are angry and people are afraid. Of what are we so angry and afraid? Not some foreign foe, not the Russians or the Chinese, but other Americans. Not since the Civil War have we Americans been so unhappy with each other. Some of the polarization which has undoubtedly occurred because of the exaggerated emphasis by the news media on violence, on street riots, and on other disruptive events. In fact, sometimes when I read my morning newspaper or turn on my TV at night, I'm reminded of the nervous little immigrant woman who, upon her arrival in America, was asked, do you advocate the overthrow of the government of the United States of America by subversion or violence? She thought for a moment and then made her choice. Violence, she said. <laughs> but some of our polarization is also the result of inflamed rhetoric. Rhetoric some of our, uh, from some of our leaders. Rhetoric from young demonstrators massing around the White House and on the campuses. Rhetoric from construction workers and other demonstrators attacking each other on Wall Street. Rhetoric across the bridge table, rhetoric on the corners of the street. We're all talking at once. We're not listening to one another. There is no excuse for any American to resort to verbal or physical violence and there is particularly no excuse for such violence to take place at any college or to spill over onto any city's main street. A college or any other school should be a place for rational debate and for learning skills, not for throwing rocks. I'd like to talk at more length about the division of our country and what I think we must do about it but it would take far more, more time than is allowed to me here. Let me say only that I am confident that if our people will try to communicate with each other, if they'll listen across the generation gap and all the other gaps, if they'll lower their voices as the President has asked us to do, we can work our way out of these troubled times. This crisis will pass. The world's greatest republic will continue to give our young men and women who are graduating in the 70s the greatest opportunities and the most abundant living of any nation on earth. What I have chosen to talk about here today is the contribution that you young people are going to make in this new and changed world which is evolving. Above and beyond your responsibilities as citizens, above and beyond your responsibility to participate in the great decisions which are now being made, it will be your responsibility to help make the world go round in a technical sense. Look around you. Everything you can see, these buildings, your transportation, the lights in this room, are the results of technology. Could you imagine our world without electricity, without electronics, without radio, television, and the computer? These devices have transformed our lives and provided us with things that have eased some of the burdens of the ages. And you are the specialists, the technicians, who must bring the vast benefits of the great technological advances directly to all of us. 
You are indispensable. This was proven most dramatically in our space program and most recently in the thrilling events surrounding the flight of Apollo 13 and its safe return. The credit for many past events have often been focused on the few, but these astronauts had the humility to diminish their roles in order to recognize that it was a team of men on the ground who made their safe return possible. It could not have been done without a computer or a thousand other electronic tools and the technicians to handle them. The astronauts of the previous flights have also taken great care to note this. President Nixon was aware of this when he made his remarks following the presidential medal, awarding the Presidential Medal of Freedom to the Apollo Mission Operations Team in Houston on April 27. He said, so as President of the United States, I wanted the opportunity to thank everybody who had helped to make this flight the success that it was, and all the others a success. I called Dr. Payne immediately after splashdown and said, I would like to do that. And he said, how many days or weeks or years do you have? There are about 300,000 that we would like to thank and then I said, then I will come down to Houston and present the Medal of Freedom to you, Dr. Payne, for the whole NASA organization. And one of the finest things the astronauts did when they returned was to visit and thank the men at Grumman and North American who built their spacecraft. These were not idle gestures. This was a recognition that the quality of every man's work counted. And each of the men who made a contribution knew he had done his best. Yes, perhaps some, someone was to blame for the mishap of the Molo, Apollo 13 flight in the first place. Perhaps someone had let down a little, had relaxed his vigilance. And perhaps, but very few places in the space program would have, it have made such a vital difference. But it is a stark example that everyone's work counts, that skill and perfection make a difference. Few are able to feel the personal rewards of such allocades for their achievements. I hope that many of you will have the pleasure of knowing the indispensable role which you will play in making our technology work not only in the dramatic areas of space, but also in all of the positions to which you may be heir in your lives. As you all well know, in graduating here today, your education is not finished. That is a lifelong task. John Gardner, a former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, has supplied a sage observation in his book titled Excellence. And I quote him. If people went on learning, he says, age and wisdom would be perfectly correlated and there would be no such thing as an old fool, a proposition sharply at odds with common experience. But the sad truth is, that for many of us, the learning process comes to an end very early indeed, and others learn the wrong things. Learning has special relevancy in your fields. Without a doubt, you are in trades and professions which are advancing at an ever-increasing pace. You will have to learn just to stay even with the pace. In addition, it is likely if not certain that you will be changing your job a number of times in your life, and this will entail more learning. You will have to learn more than is expected of you simply to maintain your job if you wish to advance. With all this learning to do, it makes sense that you learn the art of learning. It is one of the highest arts, 
and none will pay greater returns. The capability of people like yourselves to keep pace is really critical in our society. In a sense, it is you who are setting the pace because no matter what machines or devices or techniques spring from men's minds, it is your ability to build them, to run them, to maintain them and improve them that governs whether our society will be able to derive from them the benefits that they can bestow. You sit in a real sense on the board of governors of our technological society. So in conclusion, let me repeat, technology is indispensable to man. It has brought him endless treasures and it will, it will bring him more. It can also be ill-used, but it is man who decides on the use. You people are indispensable to our technology. It simply cannot work without you. This keeps...